Well, greetings, church. Yeah. All right, some familiar voices. Hey, I'd like to invite you to find Matthew 22 in your Bibles today. As you're finding our text, let me welcome those of you watching online and those at the Prince William and Loudon location. It is good to be together to study and learn and listen from the Word of God. My name is Todd Peters, I'm the location pastor for Prince William. And for those of you who've only been with NBC for a couple of years, you may not know that my journey started right here at Tyson's. Upon military transfer to DC, my family jumped right in and started serving in the Rock and the Access community. It thrilled my wife's heart and mine as well uh, to have our three teenagers serving in the local church. Later, two of our kids went on staff and continued to serve in the Access community. Uh, this group of people will always hold a special place in our hearts. After serving the SEAL teams for nearly three decades, I prayed for the Lord's direction and on how I could serve him next, and little did I know he would lead me to something much more dangerous than my previous job. You see, God led me to work and serve with teenagers. That's right, teenagers. God also has a great sense of humor. My first day on the job was leading a New Year's Eve lock-in with over 1,000 teenagers in this very building. To further this saga, that same night, I earned my first nickname, the murderer of love. <laughs> you see, I had men and women posted in every nook and cranny of this building. No way was romance going to happen on my watch. <laughs> Having served in student ministry, perhaps because of my nickname, I was moved on. And, uh, but for four years, I had the privilege of working with teenagers. And so I do applaud parents and encourage you, let those kids go to camp where they can be focused and sit under the word of God and worship. Promise you, wonderful things can happen at camp. Amen. Amen, indeed. So upon my arrival with the PW congregation, I shared the familiar saying that if you're a hammer, everything is a nail. And I said, well, I'm a youth pastor, so now you are my new youth group. What was encouraging was that same day after sharing this with the local church, I had some senior saints in their 90s come up to me and say, it's about time somebody gets us. <laughs> after serving at NBC for 10 years, I can tell you I still have the same passion and joy to share the word of God with boys and girls of all ages. We are in a sermon series called Now I See It. It's an opportunity for the church to hear from multiple pastors this summer from various locations at NBC. In some ways, it's a lot like encaustic painting. Encaustic painting is when you melt wax of different colors and layer upon layer ultimately reveals the finished picture. As you listen to each pastor and learn how God's word has anchored truth in their own lives, our prayer is that you will see the picture of a perfect savior working in imperfect men. In our time together, my hope is to show you what God has been teaching me from Matthew 22 and how it is foundational in all that we do as believers. My prayer and preparation this week has been for God to reveal the same truth for every man and woman, boy and girl here today. For those taking notes, I'll share two truths from our text and then I'll share and ask two questions for you to consider. We'll then close and I will share two applications to help you live out these wonderful truths. And then we'll close in a time of prayer and ask God to help us on this journey to live out the Word of God. Our message is called, No Less Than All, and our focus will be on that little word, all, today, and the massive implications that come with it and living it out in our lives. Let's turn our attention now to the Word of God, beginning in Matthew 22, verse 34. And this is the Word of God. Well, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, I ask that you would please work in me and through me to build up your church. And Father, I also ask that you would speak to my brothers and sisters today from your word. For those who need comfort, may you provide it. For those who need correction, may you guide as only you can. And lastly, Father, 
I don't begin to pretend all the cares and hurts that people have brought here today. But I pray uh, that you would do a great work in each and every heart present. And for those listening who are still exploring Christianity, would you reveal yourself to them today? May today be the day of salvation for those who don't know your great name. And we pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. And the church said? Amen. Amen, church. Well, one of the reasons Navy SEALs execute their missions with success is they spend a great deal of time on the basics. Unlike the movies with all the fancy gadgets and special moves, the key to success comes from something we like to call shoot, move, and communicate. We spend time shooting in every imaginable situation, from scorching deserts where the temperatures break 150 degrees to the exact opposite in the Arctic chill that will almost feel like it's going to break your bones of negative 60 Fahrenheit. We then build upon this and add movement from jumping out of all things that fly to driving all types of vehicles on land and sea, walking, running, skiing, swimming, diving, locking out of submarines, being able to move is essential to success. Finally, we then add communication. It's key that we communicate well and have primary and secondary and even tertiary plans and a loss of communication plan. Once we've done all this, we then start the hard stuff. After 12 to 18 months of training, with only a few days off, we then deploy and go around the globe to serve our great country. Upon return, after a luxurious week or two off, we repeat the whole process over. Now, I can imagine some of you are thinking, what in the world does this have to do with Matthew 22? Everything. Let me explain. Shoot, move, and communicate has become synonymous in my life with love God and love others. The phrase shoot, move, communicate is foundational for all SEAL operators. And I would argue that loving God and loving others is foundational for all believers. Both concepts are easy to understand, but they are so hard to live out. One is life giving on the physical battlefield, and one is life giving on the spiritual battlefield. Before we look at our passage, let me offer a caution and an encouragement. As a caution, don't tune out just because these are familiar verses. This is a treasure, and in this text, I do not want you to miss what God has for you today. And as an encouragement, I actually want you to look around today. Look at the person sitting beside you on the left and right. If you're home and you don't have anybody with you, think of people you look up to. Seriously, look around. Look at the people around you. Now, realize none of us have loved God completely, and none of us have loved others like we love ourselves. Not one. Only the Lord Jesus Christ has ever lived up to these commandments. This doesn't mean we resign and give up. Rather, we should go to the Lord all the more and ask him for help. We find Jesus in Matthew 22 going through a round of gotcha questions by various religious leaders. In round one, he dealt with the Pharisees pairing up with the Herodians. Round two came from the Sadducees. And round three brought back the Pharisees with one of the experts in the law. Matthew 22, verse 34 says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now imagine how excited the Pharisees were to see Jesus defeat their rival, the Sadducees. The word silenced in verse 34 means to muzzle, like muzzling an animal or silencing them. So you know they were so happy inside. And now they have a chance to bring in a ringer. Considering they were in Jerusalem, they probably would have had no problems finding an expert in the law. The specific type of lawyer was most likely a scribe. These men spent their lives copying scriptures to preserve them from decay and from error. Because they were in constant contact with God's word, they became very knowledgeable. As we consider the question given to Jesus, we might ponder and think he would have reviewed one of the Ten Commandments. But it's good for us to know that at the time of this quiz, there were 613 commandments in the Old Testament law that the scribes had written down. They further broke them down into heavy or important commandments and light or unimportant commandments commandments. 248 were positive and 365 were negative. It reminds me of meeting with some parents here many years ago and they were furious with their teenage boy. 
Imagine that as a teenage boy, your parents being upset with you. Mom and dad brought in a legal pad, and I thought it was best to maybe have the young man go downstairs to the cafe and wait. They presented their case, they put the legal pad on my desk, and they said, we are furious that our son is not obeying our rules. Fair enough, may I look at him? I pick up the legal pad, and I notice they have 100 rules for their teenage boy. I did my best not to laugh, but I did. It didn't go over well. I don't recommend that if you're a counselor. <laughs> and they said, what is so funny? I said, well, I'm pretty sure God gave us 10 and we couldn't keep those. <laughs> Can you guess maybe the two that I steered them towards? With no delay, Jesus responds from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, which is often called the Shema, from the Hebrew word for hear which is the first word in the passage. Now, when I think about hearing, I think about dog training. My wife and I have trained a few pups over the years, and I've learned that in the original language, the word hear means to obey. And I remember training old Duke up there, and I said, you know what? Isn't life better when you obey? And no longer did I finish that statement to this dog, then I felt like the Holy Spirit was like, you're right, Todd. Life is better when you obey, isn't it? And so uh, from there, I, I proceeded to go a little easier on the dog training. The Shema would have been the most understood and recognized passage in all Judaism. Jewish people quoted it twice a day, and they hung it on their doors. Matthew 22 continues in verse 37, and Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. God calls his followers to love him with everything they have, their heart, soul, and mind. The heart represents values and commitments, and the mind signifies thoughts and plans. Upon studying this passage, I was reminded that there's no word in Hebrew for mind. Rather, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for heart is used when thinking is taking place. This leads us to our first truth. We are to love God completely. In Hebrew thought, a person is not divided into different areas, as the Greek philosophers do. Rather, Jesus is saying we are to love God completely. Once again, just because this is easy to say does not mean it is easy to do. Many years ago, God engraved this passage on my heart, and I've yet to get a fist bump from the Lord at the end of the day for living it out completely. To add to this challenge, Jesus didn't stop there. He continued by adding the second most important command where he quoted from Leviticus 19, verse 18. Jesus quoted this verse three times more than any other Old Testament text in the New Testament. And I've learned when you study the Bible and you look for things repeated, they're important. It's almost as if God is trying to tell us that he's all about the business of love and we should pay attention. Verse 39. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Jesus is placing the vertical love of God with the horizontal love of mankind as the foundation of all Scripture. Years ago, I was stationed in Alaska, and we built some boat barns. Nothing complicated, but we brought in the Navy Seabees who can build just about anything. And the gentleman that was in charge was a reservist, and he had actually built the kingdom. So he was more than qualified to lay a rectangle pad down for us for our boat barn. And I started asking him questions, and he explained what reinforced concrete uh, was made of. It's made of concrete and steel, just two things. What's interesting to me is that concrete is designed for a vertical load or a load on top of the concrete, where the rebar is placed to take stress horizontally. And when I picture reinforced concrete, I can't help but think about the picture of the cross, this vertical relationship we have with the Lord and this horizontal relationship we have with others around us. Leads us to our second point and our second truth. We are to love others sacrificially. Don't miss how original Jesus' answer was. This combination of love God and love others was the first time both were considered and linked together. There's no evidence that before Jesus, these two passages were ever combined. It's fair to say there's a distinction between the two commandments, but there is no division. Both these commandments teach how to love God and man. 
one must remember that they are easier in concept than to do in real life. How many of us have started the day in word and in prayer and then headed out the door, fired up for the Lord, and then blew it on our commute before we even made it to work? I'm glad I'm not the only one. It also reminds me of a test that took place at a seminary. You have some very proud young men that were studying the Good Samaritan. And the task before them was to write a lengthy paper and then defend it before the professors. But the professors had a setup. You see, they made their way to give their presentation, and as soon as they arrived at their staggered times, there was a sign saying, hey, your meeting is now at this building. And they designed it in such a way that there was a choke point where they had to go down an alley to get to this building. And in that alley was a man in distress. And they wanted to see what these men who had been studying the Good Samaritan would do. All 10 of them blew by the injured man to make sure they got there on time to present. All 10 of them failed. It reminds me that a person can be so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. We certainly don't want to fall in that category, do we? The teaching of Jesus on loving others spread to other New Testament writers as well. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 13, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Paul continues in Galatians 5.14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. James went as far as to call this teaching the royal law. In verse, or chapter 2, verse 8 of James, he says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. When we think about loving others like ourselves, we would do well to look at the sacrificial love of Jesus recorded in Philippians 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you're here today or you're listening online and you're still exploring Christianity, I have the best news in the world to share with you now. The Bible tells us that God created us to be with him. The Bible also tells us our sin separates us from a holy God. And to make matters worse, The Bible then tells us our sins cannot be removed by good deeds. We struggle with this in the West. We've been taught since birth, if you do something, you get something. But that's not how the Bible explains salvation. But God knew that. And that's why he sent his son Jesus to live that perfect life, to die in your place and to die in mine. And the part I get thrilled about over and over and will never tire of is that everyone, and that means everyone, who places their faith and trust in what Jesus Christ has done can have eternal life, and that eternal life can begin today. Amen. That's the gospel. That's the good news. As we consider these two simple truths from Jesus' teaching on loving God and loving others, let's pause and ask some important questions. First, do you love God completely? This means with everything you are, do, and have. This may be a better question to ask someone who knows you well. How would they evaluate how you spend your time, your treasure, and your talents? As a reminder, this is not an exercise in beating yourself up. Rather, it's an honest review of how you are currently loving God. Second, do you love others sacrificially? Do you pray for others? When someone comes to you and asks for prayer, do you actually follow up and go to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and pray on their behalf? Do you look for physical needs that you can meet in the local church? Loving others like you love yourself means treating them the way you would like to be treated. It also means pursuing peace and building one another up. Be honest with yourself. Are you doing these things? 
Thankfully, we don't have to walk this road alone. Every child of God has the Holy Spirit to guide them and lead them on this journey to be more like Jesus Christ. Loving God and loving others are not just a catchy slogan either. They are clear commands from the Word of God. And I believe God expects no less than all from every one of his children. So where do we begin on this quest? And I will tell you in preparation this week, there have been so many things on my heart to share. But let me give you just two applications to get you started. The first one is relational evangelism. Now, as soon as I say this, I know some saints are going to sound the retreat. But let me encourage you to stay on the battlefield. Please know that if God can work with this simple country boy up here, he can work through any of you to share the gospel too. Let me share a few things that I've learned over four decades of sharing Christ with others. First, talk to God about people before you talk to people about God. Realize he loves them even more than you do. Years ago, I bought my first black truck. And as soon as I pulled off in that black truck, you know what I saw everywhere? I saw black trucks. It's like everybody owned them. And as I was thinking about black trucks, I couldn't help but think that when the Lord leads us to pray for lost people, do you know what you see? You see lost people. The more time we pray and care for lost people, the more God will be faithful and bring them to mind and to your very presence to share the hope you have from Jesus Christ. But you've got to care enough to show up and pray for them. Second, please know that you and I don't save anyone. Only God calls dead men to life. When I was younger, I would get discouraged if someone didn't choose to follow the Lord. I now understand our job is to be a faithful ambassador and share the truth in love. God does the saving when you understand this, and you can go into gospel conversations with confidence and with peace. Next, this may sound oversimplified, but develop a relationship. When you care about someone, it actually shows. No amount of studying will ever replace genuine love for others. Also realize the solution is not to have a pastor or other leader in the church share the gospel for you. God has provided someone to share with that person you know, and that person is you. When I led the youth, I reminded them of this often. For you see, it is in their daily walk when they are following the Lord that other people will know what they believe. And they will have that ability to share, and they will have the credibility because they've actually walked it like they talked it. Next, at some point, you do need to share the gospel. And if you don't know how, get with one of your pastors or other leaders in the church. We live for this, and we want to equip you. But we've also realized this. Our job is to equip the saints, and your job is to go out there and be faithful in this ministry of sharing the gospel with a lost and dying world. Earlier this year, David gave a shout out to all grandparents and their eagerness to speak about their grandkids to include showing pictures. I may have been one of those grandparents taking up space on his phone. But the point is this, grandparents speak about their grandkids because they love them. If you're a child of God and you've come to understand what God has done for you, you will love him too so much that you will risk that ridicule and shame to tell people about the love of God. Amen. This is one way to love God and love others. I'm also reminded I was blessed to get an email from a mom maybe a year and a half ago, and she took action based off of one of the Todd Talk videos because her three-year-old boy wanted to make cookies for the garbage man. Well, after two weeks, she relented, and she finally made cookies for the garbage man. The little boy was so happy, and he was jumping up and down, and the garbage man pulled up, and he ran out there with that plate of cookies, and he delivered them, and Mom was there. And do you know what the garbage man did? He cried. He had never had anybody give him anything. And the mom sensed a moment here, and she said, would you like to talk? And he said, actually, I'm done after this next stop, and I'd love to talk. So she invited him over, and they sat down on the porch, and they shared a cup of coffee, and she was able to lead the garbage man to Christ that day. Amen. Because the three-year-old boy was led by the Lord. I share this with you to take away your excuses. If a three-year-old boy can respond to the Spirit's leading, so can you. 
Sometimes we think we have to have all these qualifications and all these fancy degrees. But really what the Lord's looking for is someone who is obedient and willing to share the love that he has for them. So my encouragement to you is don't put this off on some further destination. If God's bringing people to mind that you need to share Christ with, please do so. And realize he's already preparing their hearts to hear all about him. The second one is discipleship. Now, this should come as no surprise if you're a part of NBC. Every week, we quote the Great Commission at the close of each service. The word commission is an order from someone who's superior to you. Yet, if we were to take a poll in our church and all the other churches watching online, we might view the Great Commission as the great suggestion. Every follower of Christ is called to make disciples. So rather than debate this, let me give you some steps on how to go about it. You see, I believe with all my heart that we need to be obedient to these marching orders. It's one of the last things Jesus commanded his followers to do. First, if you don't know how to go about it, get with a pastor and again, realize we live for this. I've learned by listening to all the different age groups in our church that it's awkward for everybody to begin. For instance, younger people tell me it's extremely awkward to go to older people and say, hey, would you disciple me? But for you younger folks, realize the older people tell me the same thing and that it would be super awkward to go to you and say, I want to disciple you. So what are we to do? Again, utilize the leadership in your church and let them broker relationships. Or better yet, maybe by now you've heard of church groups. Church groups is a natural vehicle to develop discipleship relationships. If you're not in a church group, pursue this. I promise you it's rewarding and it's one of the ways that you can become more like Christ. Now, that you have someone to pour into, where do you begin? This is how I go about it, and it's certainly, uh, I'm sure there's ways that could be done much better, but consider this formula to at least get you started. One, you cannot go wrong by starting to read the Bible together. You can use our Bible reading plan or any other Bible reading plan, but get in the Word together and discuss God's Word. Along with the Word, pray together. And if this proves challenging, Consider listening to David Platt's Pray the Word podcast. I promise you, you'll be equipped after listening to a few sessions there. And another useful thing to do is challenge each other to memorize God's Word and share your faith. Time permitting, you may also want to read a meaningful book together. My all-time favorite for discipleship is Knowing God by J.I. Packer. He takes some very high-level theology and he brings it right down the street. And if this country boy can understand it, I know you can too. Lastly, and this will take the most time to establish, practice accountability. Men are usually slower at this, but no matter who you are, man or woman, we all need a battle buddy. Relational evangelism and discipleship are wonderful ways to display the love of God and the love of others. I remember years ago in youth ministry, having a giant window and a mirror up for an illustration for the kids one day. And I told them, I've learned over time that if I provide a window into my soul, and let you take a deep look into me, God's very faithful at putting up a mirror and allowing you to reflect on what's going on in your own soul. And that's what I want to do now as we close. In January, I preached about the God of the mountains and the God of valleys from this same pulpit. And I shared that I'm learning more to be transparent as a man and as a pastor. Some time ago, I expressed to my wife that I need to do a better job of spending less time on a bullhorn and more time uh, practicing and modeling the behavior that I'd like to see. Thus, the quest for sharing more from my heart. This includes the highs and the lows, and God's word guides my heart even now. Consider Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, an all-time favorite since childhood. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. I like how A.W. Tozer describes this kind of faith. For true faith... It is either God or total collapse. And not since Adam stood up on the earth has God felt a single man or woman who trusted him. Just a few days ago, our family welcomed in our fourth granddaughter, Olive Faith Day. Seven pounds, 12 ounces, 20 inches long of pure beauty. And it was a mighty fine day. I got to hold her yesterday, and it was awesome. Our hopes are overwhelmed. Thank you. 
We are definitely overwhelmed with this little bundle of joy, and you know I'll be updating David and many others and filling up their phones on a regular basis. To say this was a mountaintop experience would be spot on. A few days before Olive was born, my wife and I received a text from our son as we were headed to vacation Bible school, and he said our oldest granddaughter, Riley, who was three, was ill, and they were on the way to the ER. We prayed and waited to hear from him. Later that day, our son FaceTimed with me from Georgia. Have you ever had one of those moments where time slows and you become aware of your breathing and you can hear your heartbeat? This was one of those times and this was one of those calls. While fighting back tears, our son told me Riley had just been diagnosed with leukemia. She was doing so poorly that they life flighted her from Georgia to Florida where she could receive better care. To say this was a moment in a valley would be an understatement. Our son then asked me to let his mom and sisters know, as well as the rest of the family. After I told my wife, we then took, took our local granddaughter, Hazel Ruth, who was two, to her parents' home so that I could update both our daughters and their husbands. Hazel noticed my wife crying, and my bride explained that Riley was sick. Immediately, Hazel prayed and asked Jesus to make Riley feel better. Hazel then offered up Hazy Bear, think Linus's blue blanket, and said, Hazy Bear will make it better too. My wife cried all the more, and Hazel said her mommy and daddy would make it better as well. Once family was updated, I immediately started contacting prayer warriors locally and globally on behalf of little Riley. Elder Wayne, whom I have had the honor of calling friend long before I came on staff, replied to my request, and knowing him, I could sense the emotion in his words when he typed, I will give God no rest in my prayers for little Riley. I cannot convey what that meant for Nancy and myself and the rest of the family. Hundreds of more prayers poured in and they have touched our soul and we know that God loves our little Riley even more than we do. And I'm sure I cried more in those first 48 hours than I have my whole life. I share this with you so that you remember, we all have mountaintop days and we all have deep, dark valley days too. Although my wife and I were stunned by this news, we also know and claim and trust the promises from God's word. Proverbs 3 and the call to trust him with all our hearts. Again, no less than all is God's charge to his children, even when it doesn't make sense to our understanding. How about you? Where is God challenging you today with this little word all? Do you love God more than anything else? What are you clinging to that would cause you to miss eternity with a God that cares so deeply for you? Are you willing to set it aside all for his glory? Do you love others enough who are lost to risk ridicule and shame by sharing the good news? And do you love others enough to invest your time, your treasure, and your talents in them so they can know the King of Kings? Or maybe, like me, you find yourself in a valley and the anguish you feel actually impacts you physically. Wherever your life finds you today, I want to share with you that God is faithful. Even when we don't understand, better, especially when we don't understand, we are to trust him all the more. Amen. No less than all is expected, and Jesus is worthy of such devotion today and forevermore. What I'd like to offer is this. I can't begin to imagine the sorrows and the hurts each one of you are going through. But I have learned that it is healthy and good for the church to pray for others. So if you need prayer today, I would ask and here in just a moment that you would stand right where you're at. Maybe you're struggling with this little word all, or maybe you're in a valley and you don't see the way out yet. Allow me to pray for you. And more importantly, allow your brothers and sisters around you to know you're hurting and to pray for you too. I love how my brother Eric shared a few weeks ago the phrase, 
it's okay to say we're not okay. I remember sharing with some people at VBS right after I found out the news the next day that my wife, God bless her, she couldn't come because the hugs would have done her in. And they were like, are you okay? They didn't know. I was like, you know what, I'm not okay. I'm hurting. But if we don't do this, how can we be the church and love and care for one another? So if you're hurting today, allow me the privilege to pray for you. I'm gonna ask you to stand. Remain standing and allow me to pray for you. And if you're at home, you know God sees your heart as well. Let's spend some time before the Lord and let's pray now. And as you stand up, think about this. You're allowing that love of God for people to see horizontally their brothers and sisters who are hurting. And then we can take those same prayers to the King of Kings vertically because you know he loves you even more than anyone else. So if you want to, you can stand and pray. If not, I'm going to pray anyway. Let's go before the Lord. Father, you see the hearts standing before you now and those listening online. Father, we uh, come to you as imperfect people with real struggles. Uh, we are so frail and timid sometimes. And all we know is to trust you. And Father, I'm so thankful for the basics, for foundational truth like loving God and loving others. And these difficult times, it's all I know to do and to trust you with my whole heart. There are so many things I don't understand, but I do understand this, Lord, that you love us so much so that you sent your son to die in our place. And having even just heard a diagnosis about a grandchild uh, who is ill and the possibilities that that can bring up, I can't imagine sending a son to die in the place, not of just strangers, but of people warring against you. So Father, I pray one for those who don't know your great name today. May you bring them home. And fathers, for my brothers and sisters who are hurting, may you just pour concrete into their hearts, foundational truth to trust you with all their heart, even when they don't understand, dear Lord. And Father, may we look back on these days as Ebenezer moments where we can point to your faithfulness and how you saw us through that valley so that we can be a shining, bright testimony for you. Father, may you do a great work in hearts today. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen, Amen church.